updates support and supply. The combined fleet staff, led by Admiral Yamamoto, thought differently. It argued for drawing the American Pacific Fleet into a full-scale engagement, and so it believed, to its destruction. Fatally, but predictably, the result was a face-saving compromise. Both strategies would be adopted, which meant that both would be weakened. An invasion force to initiate the naval staff strategy assembled at Rabaul. On the 4th of May, the convoy sailed for Port Moresby, the key to New Guinea. Less than a week earlier, the American carriers Hornet and Enterprise had left Pearl Harbor with their battle groups bound for the Coral Sea. Two other carriers, Lexington and Yorktown, had sailed two weeks previously. On May the 4th, the Battle of the Coral Sea was initiated when Yorktown launched airstrikes against the invasion fleet from Rabaul. The next day, the main Japanese strike force built around the carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku entered the Coral Sea. The American and Japanese fleets engaged without significant results on the 7th, but around 0800 hours in the morning of May the 8th, the carrier forces located each other. The first time, those serving aboard ships in a naval action never saw their opponents. The Lexington was hit and abandoned, Chokaku disabled and forced to retire, and Zuikaku though undamaged, lost 40% of her air group. The consequences of all this were to be enormous. The fact that the Americans were obliged to withdraw would allow the Japanese to claim a victory, but it was a victory that compelled Japan to abandon plans for an invasion of New Guinea from the sea. Had they landed, they would have faced Australian defenders who were present in only brigade strength. The Japanese, as we will see, decided instead to take Port Moresby by an overland route. Admiral Yamamoto's argument for an alternative strategy had been strengthened by an action on April the 18th that did little damage and took only 50 lives. On that day, 16 specially adapted B-25 bombers had taken off from the carrier Hornet on a bombing raid over Tokyo. The raid is in the history books in the name of its commander, the Doolittle Raid. The aircraft did not have the range to return to the carrier, so they flew on to land in China, where most crashed. Crews that crashed into Japanese hands became prisoners of war. Three were shot by firing squad. Crews that crashed in China survived. But the real story was the impact on Japan. Bombs had fallen in Tokyo. Bombs had fallen close to the Imperial Palace. Bombs had threatened the life of the Emperor. The shock and shame of this cried out for a response from a military caste whose first duty was to defend the Emperor. Planning began for a counter-blow which would neutralize America's capacity to launch raids on the home islands. It was evident to Japanese planners that flights from the nearby Chinese mainland were a possibility, and so, on April 21st, only a couple of days after the Doolittle Raid, Japan's Chinese Expeditionary Army was ordered to knock out air bases in Chekiang and Kiangxi. By mid-May, the Chinese had been routed east of Chekiang. A second Japanese army advanced in late May, and by early July, the Expeditionary Army had met all of its objectives. Before then, in May, Yamamoto's moment had arrived. The action of the combined fleet would finally neutralize American naval strength in the Pacific and, importantly, deal with a small Hawaiian outlier that had provided cover for the carriers from which the Doolittle Raiders flew, a place 3,100 kilometers from the nearest continent in any direction. Midway, 
American codebreakers led by Commander Joseph Rochefort knew that the Imperial Japanese Navy was going to a place designated AF, but they didn't know where AF was. A false message sent from American HQ to the US fleet advised that Midway was running short of fresh water. Snapping at the trap, the Japanese relayed the message advising that AF was short of water. The US fleet had the key to the lock. AF stood for Midway and the Imperial Japanese Navy was going there. Not much more than 60 ships were involved in the battle. Midway would not be decided by fleets of warships. It was the almost 500 aircraft that the opposing navies would use like long-range cannon that would settle the issue. The Battle of the Coral Sea ruled the carriers Zuikaku and Shokaku out of the attack on Midway. USS Yorktown, damaged in the same battle, was estimated to require three months for repair. But 1,400 workmen completed the work in two days, and she took her place with the American fleet. It takes many sorts of hero to win a war. The Japanese sent a diversionary force under Admiral Hosogaya north to the Aleutians, but Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, commanding Pacific Ocean areas, was not distracted. He ordered his forces to meet where he expected the main enemy blow to fall, at Midway. Task Force 16, Admiral Raymond Spruance, and Task Force 17, Admiral Jack Fletcher, sailed to their rendezvous with each other, with the Japanese, and with history. And they sailed to meet an enemy that, in every measurable sense, outgunned them. The battle opened on June the 4th, when aircraft from Admiral Nagumo's first striking force attacked aircraft and installations on Midway itself. When the aircraft returned to the carriers, the Admiral decided to re-equip them with bombs rather than torpedoes and launch a second attack on the island. His fleet was, meanwhile, repelling American aircraft attacks. The Americans took significant losses with no hits. But not without effect. The carrier forces were somewhat dispersed, their fighter cover was operating at low altitude and flight decks were crowded with rearming and refueling aircraft. 1020, Admiral Nagumo gave the order to launch when ready. Within five minutes, they would launch and the Admiral would stand on the brink of a great victory. They were, instead, five minutes that decisively changed the course of the battle and the war. On that first day, we uh, hit about 30 ships of all types, battleships, coaches, destroyers, and transports. Second day, we hit the carriers. Uh, Any luck with them? Oh, yes. Talked right in there. It's my mom and Harry. In those five minutes, Commander Wade McCluskey of the USS Enterprise's bombing 6 Squadron led his 37 dauntless dive bombers in from 14,500 feet in a 70-degree dive at 280 knots. The carrier Alongi was the first hit, then Kanga, last Sorgu when Yorktown's dive bombers joined the assault. Japan lost four carriers, more than 2,000 seamen and 250 aircraft. This was not, in terms of human life, a terrible battle. In terms of influence on history, it was in the front rank. Japanese losses equalized the strength of the opposing fleets. Between 1942 and 1944, Japan would add six new fleet carriers, the USA, 14. In fact, through the war, for every major naval vessel built in Japanese shipyards, the Americans built 16. 
The news of Midway was passed to Prime Minister Tojo in typically obtuse language. The Navy, he was told by General Moritaki Tanabe, has made a great mistake. Japan lost no territory as a result of its mistake, but Midway's effects would be felt when, towards the end of 1943, the Americans began to prise open the defensive perimeter. Japan would have inadequate ships and, above all, aircraft. In 1942, Japan lost twice the number of aircraft it produced. As great naval forces clashed in the war's first significant turning point at Midway, the war in Western Europe was being confined almost entirely to the skies. It was, for a long time, the only means that Britain had of carrying the fight to her enemy. One third of Britain's national output was devoted to the strategic air offensive. When the war had started, bombing was conducted according to strict rules. In 1939, the Chamberlain government had rejected a suggestion that the Black Forest be bombed on the grounds that much of it was private property. But to point out the obvious, desperate times called for desperate measures. Almost 150,000 Rolls-Royce Merlin engines were built. The V-12 power plant drove some of the most famous planes of the war. Spitfire, Hurricane, Mosquito, Mustang, and the four-engined Avro Lancaster. The Lancaster was a true heavy bomber. Its bomb load of 6.35 metric tons overshadowed the B-17 Flying Fortress and the German Heinkel 111 and Junkers 88, all of which carried between two and three tons. By general ascent, the best night bomber of the war, the Lancaster was not without faults. Because of poorly placed escape hatches, the average survival rate for the seven-man crew of a disabled Lancaster was 1.3 persons. For the less glamorous Halifax, it was 2.45. The Avro Lancaster, most powerful and efficient bomber in the world, and one of the most important war-winning weapons yet devised by the United Nations. The Lancaster entered service with Bomber Command of the Royal Air Force at the same time as the G radio navigation device came into use. Such developments encouraged the RAF to redefine its bombing strategy. On February the 14th, 1942, the Area Bombing Directive was issued. It named the Ruhr, and specifically Essen, in the middle of that conurbation, as primary targets, with Duisburg, Dusseldorf and Cologne as other cities to be attacked. The, the bomber offensive undoubtedly was a major con contribution to, us, to, to our winning the war, no doubt about that, but it was a pretty ruthless business. To drive home the strategy, a new head of Bomber Command was appointed. Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris, one of the most controversial Allied commanders. If you individually succeed, you will have delivered the most devastating blow against the very vitals of the enemy. Let him have it right on the chin. Send that message to all groups and stations. That was how Air Marshal Harris, Commander-in-Chief Bomber Command, gave his instructions for the largest air raid the world has ever known. At aerodromes up and down the country, well over a thousand British-built bombers were being prepared for their journey over the heart of Germany's biggest... Harris was given a job. It was to deliver on the objective of the Area Bombing Directive, and that document explained that the purpose of dropping bombs was... They don't know what they're dropping when they drop them bombs. I don't care what anybody says, because I saw what it was. They bombed everything. Especially in Nuremberg, when I finally wound up in Nuremberg, the lower Nuremberg was level. And the top of Nuremberg, that was pretty well level too. It, it was pathetic to see all that. And then you see the old people, the old lady getting the bricks and knocking the cement off. They were ready to rebuild. They knew they lost the war, but they weren't gonna lose their lives, you know? 
focus attacks on the morale of the enemy's civil population and, in particular, industrial workers. Area bombing remains perhaps the most controversial of all of the military strategies of the war. Pre-war projections both stimulated expenditure on bombers and advocacy of their use. Official British planning was based on a projected casualty rate of 50 casualties per tonne of bombs dropped. In the event, the death toll for the London Blitz was one per tonne, and the overall death toll in Germany was half that. As early as 1941, even Winston Churchill was beginning to doubt the prophecies about the effectiveness of bombing. It is very disputable, he said, whether bombing by itself will be a decisive factor in the present war. Essen was first attacked on the night of the 8th, 9th of March, and then on March the 28th, 9th, the RAF attacked Lübeck. 234 aircraft attacked, 13 were lost, Lübeck was virtually lost. Lübeck was a port where engines for U-boats were manufactured. It was also an historical, medieval, beautiful city, and it was laid waste. In retaliation, Hitler ordered attacks on British cities that qualified as targets because they were beautiful. All they had in common was prominence in tourist guides like the Bedecker, and indeed, the raids became known as the Bedecker Raids. A raid on Augsburg with heavy losses persuaded Harris to abandon daytime bombing, and from late April, Bomber Command flew by night. Rostock was attacked to great effect, and at the end of May, Cologne was hit in the first 1,000 bomber raid. The operational order was succinct. Object, to destroy the city of Cologne. Barely two days later, almost as great a number hit Essen, and at the end of June, Bremen was the target. Harris was, until the very end of the war, unshakable in his belief that bombing would bring Germany to her knees, that the disruption to industry and the effect on civilian morale, victims of what was euphemistically called de-housing, would hasten the end of the war. Area bombing had the advantage that it did not depend on accurate bomb aiming, which various reports had proved was beyond the reach of current equipment. The Butt Report, analyzing the effectiveness of Bomber Command's actions in the summer of 1941, had found that only one in four bombers had dropped their loads within eight kilometers of their targets. On nights when there was no moon, it was only one in 20. In fact, in 1941, Bomber Command had suffered more casualties than it had caused. Crews dying, as the British military historian Sir John Keegan put it, largely to crater the German countryside. They had not arranged for people who had done their 30 operations to come back and say to officers, now, fellas, this is the sort of thing that you've got to protect yourself against. And if you maintain your height at about, say, 7,000 feet or 10,000 feet, that'll be about the best protection you can get. But they didn't do that. All we had to were just raw recruits doing bombing raids on Germany. A mistake to suppose that the bombers were attacking defenceless civilians. The cities were well defended. Indeed, anti-aircraft defense tied up one million German service personnel. And although it represented only 7% of British military manpower, Bomber Command took 24% of British military deaths. As we came out of the target area, I got caught in this beam. I've thought of it a thousand times since as to what I did. I had absolutely no doubt I should have just remained at the same height and flew and kept on changing course. But instead of that, I attempted to get out of the beam by increasing my speed. And I did that by diving. Got free of the beam, but it wasn't very long before the retired gunner was reporting that we were being attacked. A night fighter. Again, I had to take whatever evasive action I thought was appropriate. 
again, it was diving. And as a result of this, of course, we lost, lost all my height. I thought I was flying at somewhere about 500 feet. And instead of that, I hit a tree. <laughs> I can remember the two of the crew coming around and saying, come on, Carl, you've got to get out of here. <laughs> and that's what I did. The bomb aimer, who was in front of me, and the wireless operators, they were killed in the crash. And that left three of us. The morality of area bombing continues to be debated and its targeting of civilian populations without regard to age or gender has led to comparisons with the criminal slaughter of the Holocaust. Of course, bombing involved the risks of war. It was not a cowardly assault on defenseless civilians. Tens of thousands of Allied airmen lost their lives. Surely the compelling distinction dividing the death camps from the bomb sites is that all sides used area bombing because all sides believed that it could and would be a war-winning weapon. No one outside the heart of Nazism has ever pretended that killing Jews, Romani, Slavs and others was going to affect the outcome of the war. In the next episode of The Price of Empire, two further turning points mark what Winston Churchill called the end of the beginning. The defeat of Rommel at El Alamein and the fate of the Wehrmacht, savaged by a red army red in tooth and claw at a place called Stalingrad. <laughs>